What are going to be the major consumers of our energy going forward? AI data centers for sure. Then we look at maybe quantum computing. We've got bit mining, throw in the development of electric vehicles. I mean, we may have already calculated, because I've joined the DOE, obviously, we have may have calculated already, but have we calculated enough in terms of how exponentially this consumption is going to go? Yeah, it's totally data centers and things like that, but it's also increased electrification, like for EVs, but all kinds of other things as well. And an increased sort of revival of industrial manufacturing that requires not just electricity, but heat. We see carbon-free steel companies wanting to start up in the United States and they don't have enough heat. Where do you get heat? Usually you burn fossil fuels. Very few clean energy sources are available to provide that direct heat. Nuclear is there for it. So yeah, we have a huge amount of demand. Are we even factoring it in? You know, the projections for how much new gigawatt worth, of, you know, many tens of gigawatts worth of capacity are going to be needed to support data centers in the coming decades to support these kinds of endeavors. They grow and grow every time you look at the news. And so we are in a position where the existing clean energy infrastructure has to expand to support those data centers, especially data centers that need 24-7, reliable, always on power. Mm. If you own a multi-billion dollar data center, you don't want it to be running at 2% capacity because the wind stopped blowing. You need 100% power 24-7, regardless of weather. And the issue there is in sort of these data centers, which are going to are and will continue to be everywhere, and the scaling of traditional power plants, nuclear power plants, you have to get to SMR, SMRs, right, which are not fully developed yet. Paul, could you tell the rest of us what SMR means? Uh, small modular reactors. Did he get it right, Catherine? Yeah. He did. I, okay, he did. Catherine, you correct. know how exhausting it is that I have to carry this guy <laughs> all the time? But in that sense, the proximity is an issue, right? Because if your data centers are too far away from the source, the nuclear source of energy, you're going to have loss of data, loss of energy. And so it becomes sort of being able to build a lot of these SMRs, which are smaller and can be closer to the data centers. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Transmission, especially building new high voltage power lines to move gigawatts of power from a generator to a consumer is expensive. It you know cuts through land that usually needs permits. Sometimes it can be very slow. So co-locating data centers with smaller more modular reactor builds has an advantage. The more modularity in these builds is certainly also supposed to contribute to the speed and reliability with which we can deploy them. The idea being that it takes a really long time to build a gigawatt scale nuclear power plant, but if you build a 30% you know, sized 300 megawatt reactor, then maybe you can build a few more of them, get some lessons learned, they maybe move a little faster, you might be paying slightly more per kilowatt hour, but you should be able to deploy them quicker and learn faster, thereby coming down the cost curve of those construction mm. learnings. That's a whole future there that has not yet been realized. We've probably had the last major nuclear power plant built 30-something years ago. Mm. In the United States? Uh, yes, in mm. the United States or around developed nations. Now you're saying, what are the new technologies, small modular reactors? Mm -hmm. SMR. Ad ad SMRs to some. <laughs> Advanced reactors. So you've, you've got these micro reactors. You've had the, all these different sort of acronyms going on. Where are we right now with the technologies and what are our options for fission and for fusion going forward? As you know what, well, you've got to have them close. The NIMBYs are going to dance up and down and scream my merry hell. We know that. So how are we going to sort this out and with what technology? Yeah, I think we have technologies at all sizes in the advanced reactor space. The most recent two builds in the United States were the Vogel Unit 3 and 4. Those are AP-1000s from Westinghouse. They're big like conventional nuclear reactors, but they incorporate some passive safety. And so they're kind of a generation three plus design at the sort of big gigawatt scale. They were built pretty over schedule and over budget. And so there's a lot of trend towards shrinking that kind of design, a light water reactor that's just smaller. You've got designs from Holtec and GE Hitachi. Westinghouse has a shrunken version of the AP-1000 called the three, uh, AP-300. Yeah, you've got New Scale is one of those small modular light water reactor designs. But then in addition to that, you can also build small modular advanced reactor designs. And there are a number of companies pursuing commercialization of that with two deployments already happening with the support of the Department of Energy. These would involve more advanced coolants and fuels like sodium, 
which is a liquid metal. Is that the molten salt? Yeah. Yeah, MSRs, yeah. yeah. What does sodium do for you? So sodium has a couple cool features as a coolant. It's highly conductive, and so it's extremely performant to move the heat from the fuel to where you need it in the turbine through an exchange process eventually. But that conduction is really useful, but it's also very helpful for the neutronics control of that criticality that I talked about earlier. So it absorbs neutrons. Yeah, so it keeps the neutrons fast by not moderating them. If you combine that with a metal fuel, sodium-cooled fast reactors have an opportunity to be quite passively safe using reactor physics and negative feedbacks from the expansion of the fuel and the expansion of the coolant and the sort of neutronic behavior of the coolant to drive power down if power goes high, keeping things balanced. Regulated. Isn't there a practicality issue though? Because corrosion is a problem with that process, right? So critically, sodium in this case is a liquid metal. When it's combined with something else, it becomes a salt. There are salt reactors. We can talk about that. But yeah, sodium itself is also somewhat corrosive. You can't see through it because it's liquid metal and it is pyrophoric. So when it gets wet, it tends to burst into flames. Good. (laughs) That's good to know. (laughs) Just so it gets wet. Yeah. (laughs) 